All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you. It's going to be a wonderful night. I think we got a few people tuning in on different channels. And uh, we some of y'all might be watching this recording afterwards, but we've been doing book club for uh, a few years now, every month, look, re, looking at a book together, reading a book, talking to the author, and uh, you're in for a treat tonight. Jonathan's going to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Lerone Martin and also the book that we're looking at tonight. But uh, real quick before, while people are kind of joining in, um, there's a few things going on just so that you know about them. Uh, one is we've been remembering the 20th anniversary of the war in Iraq and the bombing of mm -hmm. Iraq. Uh, mm -hmm. Jonathan uh, organized a powerful reunion of some of the the peacemakers that we were with standing against the war 20 years ago before some of y'all were born, bless you. But we were remembering that tragedy uh, and, and also remembering so we don't so we don't do something like that again. Um, and we're going to um, we've we've also recorded just morning prayer with Jonathan and some of the folks we were in Iraq with. But we also did a special event with Diana Ostrike, who's on staff at Red Letter Christians and is a veteran. So she saw another side of this war as she was a veteran mm. turned conscientious objector uh, and peacemaker standing against the war. Uh, so it's a, it was a powerful night on the 19th. If you didn't catch that, you can watch the, the video. And we do the, we do morning prayer on the first of each month. Uh, Jonathan and I co-host Common Prayer, and we would love for y'all to join us or to watch it afterwards if you're working or the time doesn't work. But April 1st, our special guest uh, is the canon Stephanie Spellers, one of the uh, leaders of the Episcopal Church, uh, working right alongside presiding Bishop Michael Curry. So she's a gem. She is something special. You don't want to miss that. We'll pray together, but we'll also talk for about a half hour with Ken and Stephanie Speller. So that's on April 1st at nine o'clock Eastern time. There's an event uh, that we're doing in Philly that'll be live streamed, remembering Dr. King's assassination. So he was killed mm -hmm. on April 4th. We're going to be chopping up a gun that is just like the one that killed Dr. King uh, at the Philadelphia Episcopal Cathedral. And we'll be beating on that gun, turning it into a garden tool. But we're going to hit it 55 times, one for each year since King's assassination mm -hmm. and tolling the bells uh, of the Episcopal Cathedral as we do it. So that'll be live streamed um, the hour that Dr. King was killed uh, mm -hmm. on April 4th at 6.01 to 7.01. So uh, join us for that if you can. Uh, next month, our book, if you haven't seen it, is Celebrities for Jesus by Caitlin Beatty. She's challenging, of course, the uh, how personas, platforms, and prophets are hurting the church. So that's going to be mm -hmm. our book next month, and Caitlin will be with us. Uh, so grab a copy of that. But tonight, tonight is the gospel. I think this one, right? Uh, the gospel of J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> so, uh, Jonathan, let me pass it to you, brother. Always a gift to be together, and uh, you can get our night going, bro. I'm going to turn you, my video Jane. off just so people see you too. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you, and hello to the Red Letter Christians. It's a joy to be together, and uh, a real delight to have uh, Dr. Lerone Martin with us. He is, uh, among many things, the director of the uh, Martin Luther King Institute at Stanford University, uh, which if you've, um, um, you know, had a chance to read Dr. King in his own words, uh, especially the things that weren't published right away during his lifetime, uh, a lot of that has been because of the work of that institute uh, publishing his papers. Uh, so we're all grateful for that. Uh, but also a great historian who has written quite the history book that we're going to dig into tonight. So uh, if you haven't already read it, uh, it's the gospel according to J. Edgar Hoover. And uh, let, let, let me just begin by asking you um, uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself, just because we're, we're kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, gathering together with this crew. Uh, the Red Letter Christians are folks, you know, all around this country and the world, really, who are trying to hold together Jesus and justice. And so just to give people a sense of where you're coming from, what's uh, What's your background with Jesus and justice? <laughs> Man, I, I appreciate the uh, the introduction and the opportunity. So thank you for for having me. 
Um, I am a, a child of the church. I um, was raised in a small town in Northwest Ohio named Fostoria, Ohio. Uh, grew up, uh, my mother was a Pentecostal. My father was a Baptist. So right. we, us we usually went to church with mom because my uh, mother felt that, you know, the Baptist folk just weren't into the fullness of the gospel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we went to church with her, um, gave my life to Christ when I was 16. Mm. Um began preaching shortly thereafter, around 17. Um, originally went to Oral Roberts University, which, you know, at the time for me is coming out of a Pentecostal charismatic background. Mm -hmm. You know, Oral Roberts was, was it might as well have been Cambridge. I mean, it was just such a, mm -hmm. a wonderful opportunity, ran track there. Um, started going through some changes in terms of how I understood faith, particularly as it related to justice. Mm. And started finally getting a hold of reading Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, transferred to a small holiness school um, in Indiana by the name of Anderson University. Um, dear friends there, good, great Christian network there. The rules there were not as strict, so we didn't have to wear a shirt and tie to class like we did at Oral Roberts. Mm. Um, but um, came through the holiness movement, was licensed to preach with the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana. Uh -huh. And then went off to Princeton Theological Seminary, where um, I really encountered studies of race, religion, justice. And I think that that was probably the most formative in my, in my spiritual journey was being at Princeton Theological Seminary. Yeah. Um, and um, I think what, uh, what I'm so excited about being with you tonight is that this question of justice was often, I felt, missing um, in my faith formation growing up. Mm -hmm. um, it was mostly focused on the kind of individual salvation, personal piety, which I you know, believed in and, and still do. But that was pretty much the end of one's salvation, was to work out your own personal piety. Mm -hmm. Broader questions about justice, I don't think I really got introduced to in a systematic way until I went to college and, and, and then on to seminary. Yeah. Well, you know, your, your journey that you're describing here is one that I, I think a lot of folks have shared, you know, having, having a personal experience of faith, following Jesus to questions of justice, and then sort of running into this, like, how do I make sense of the way that the institutions of my faith and a lot of the, the kind of like people who have represented it, people who've been influential uh, have, have sort of, resisted that and sometimes even opposed it and right. um, in the last several years um, some of the people who've, who've I think helped us the most to understand that have been historians um, so I mean the, um, my friend Jamar Tisby wrote a book mm -hmm. on the color of compromise trying to kind of get at this in terms of the long history of uh, of the way race has divided the church on just these issues and um, uh, Kristen Dumay's book, which we've done in the book club, uh, has certainly addressed this in terms of, you know, Jesus and John Wayne and this kind of uh, culture of sort of hyper masculinity that uh, uh, has has been, and right alongside this issue of white Christian nationalism, which of course you are addressing in this book, and really uh, focusing in on the incredible influence that the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, had on all of the culture around this. So, yes. so let's dive into the book. Uh, uh, I, well, ma maybe we could start by uh, the way you start the book, which is um, explaining to people why you had to sue the FBI uh, to get some of Billy Graham's files in order to write a book on J. Edgar Hoover. I mean, that kind of gets at a lot of the tangle right there. <laughs> it does, it does. Uh, let me just start by saying a bit about what I started to do. I mm. thought I was going to write a book on religious radio. I wasn't sure what, huh. but my plan was religious radio because I had written a book about the role of the of record players and phonographs and the buying and selling of sermons because I was coming out of Oral Roberts. I was really fascinated by this televangelism thing and how all this got started of buying and selling sermons. Yeah. So I wrote this book called, um, 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 I can't even remember the name of my own book, Preaching on Wax. Preaching on Wax, yeah, I know Preaching the book. On wax. <laughs> and so I said, well, next is, is radio. And so mm -hmm. I set out to do radio. I had two important encounters. The first encounter was with a colleague of mine at Washington University in St. Louis by the name of Bill Maxwell, who wrote a book on the FBI surveillance of African-American writers. Mm -hmm. The book is called FBI's. 
And um, we had coffee in May of 2014 and he had finished had just finished the book. And he simply said, you know, um, that he was like, you know, you might want to check and see if the FBI is interested in any of your radio preachers. And I thought that was an interesting idea. And then a couple months later, in August of that year, Michael Brown was killed in St. Louis. Mm. And as the as the grand jury was considering whether or not to press charges, I met several ministers in the St. Louis area who told me the FBI had contacted them and said, you know, what are you going to do to help us to make sure the city doesn't explode? Mm. And that really got me thinking you know, how long has the FBI not just been involved in surveillance, but actually trying to partner with ministers? I think that's what really got me thinking. Interesting. So I decided to, to start changing the Freedom of Information Act request I started to make from my conversation with Bill Maxwell. At first, I was just filing Freedom of Information Act um, cases on people I knew the FBI was concerned about, Martin Luther King Jr., mm-hmm. uh, Malcolm X, any type of religious figure, Dorothy Day, right? Any type of figure that I thought the FBI would be concerned with. But then I switched to said, well, what about folks maybe the FBI might like? So I started making requests and ended up, you know, when Billy Graham passed away Mm. in 2018, you know, I was making all these requests. And then I knew that the law had stated that once a person was deceased, they no longer have privacy rights over textual materials within the executive branch of the federal government. So I requested Billy Graham's file. And the statute states that the Freedom of Information Act statute states that the executive branch has to respond to you within 20 working days. Two months went by and I never heard a thing. Finally, I got a letter in April that said, we haven't made a determination yet. We don't know if we have anything, we'll let you know. And Mm -hmm. I knew that that was against the law, but you know, it was like, as my, you know, as my father would say, it's the federal government. What do you what are you going to do? And so finally, what um, I met an attorney and he, we were discussing what we were both working on, uh, Tuwan Samahan, who teaches at Villanova. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, you should you should sue, you know, as, as a good lawyer. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know the first thing about suing. I don't know if I want to sue the federal government. And he said, you know, I've done it before. I'll take your case. Um, I'll do a pro bono. And so um, that's how the the lawsuit um, uh, came forward about trying to figure out what was Billy Graham's relationship to the FBI. Mm. And I was denied. I didn't get much material. Um, The court did order the FBI to give to me whatever they had. So on a rolling basis, I received things on Billy Graham, such as um, a large amount of newspaper clippings. The FBI kept track of where Billy Graham was traveling, what he said, and also death threats. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I should start making requests for the world around Billy Graham. So I made requests for Christianity Today, the National Religious Broadcasters, um, Youth for Christ, um, Campus Crusade for Christ. Mm -hmm. And and that's what really formed the basis of this book was getting those FBI files and able to see what these individuals, um, what, what they were doing and what relationship they had to the FBI. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's get to that. But to get to that in the book, you begin by telling the story of this central character uh, whose name is in the title, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. And I was I was fascinated by um, his faith formation. I mean, just this, you know, this uh, this kid who's superintendent of the Sunday school in his church in a military uniform. I mean, yes, yes. Describe a little bit of this. I mean, this is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think most people don't know. Yeah, J. Edgar Hoover decide, um, um, decided that he would wear his high school cadet uniform uh, to teach his Sunday school classes. Mm-hmm. And then most of his classmates thought that was very strange, but Hoover found it to be just very appropriate. And mm-hmm. he um, was led the cadets at his high school, Central High School in Washington, D.C., which was an elite premier high school um, in D.C. Um, and he was very adamant about Sunday school and he saw the two was going together as his, his cadet uniform going with his Sunday school um, vocation. And his diary, his, his, his teenage diary um, is filled with the constant um, record keeping that he would use later as the FBI director. But the record keeping is filled with his Sunday school lessons. 
So I was able to track and say, you know, on Monday, he would say, you know, started started preparing my Sunday school lesson for the next Sunday. He was very adamant about starting on Monday, having it done by Tuesday. And looking at the Sunday school um, um, records, I was able to track and see which verses he was thinking about, reflecting upon the recommendations that Sunday school, the American Sunday school was making for Sunday school teachers to teach. And so we were able to track and see what type of messages he was pondering and reflecting upon all while wearing his cadet uniform on Sunday morning to teach Sunday school. Yeah. And then it turns out that this kind of faith-centered, highly regimented uh, vision for uh, public service and nationalism uh, becomes influential in terms of how he sets up the FBI. Uh, That's right. That's I right. I thought those those uh, retreats that he was sending uh, agents on, G-men on from early on, were was a fascinating piece, and and actually brings in a connection to the whole Catholic world there. It does. It does. He he came into the FBI in 1924 and began to clean it up. Um, he um, by clean up, I mean, clean up from his perspective. Mm -hmm. um, he got rid of uh, the, the men of color who were working as special agents. He got rid of any women who were working as special agents and began a series of hiring exclusively white and Protestant and Catholic men had them sign a law this enforcement. Would, this would be shortly after Wilson had just resegregated the federal government, right? That's right. That's right. Exactly right. He's, exactly he's right. Kind of part of the 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 backlash against the 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 you know bit of bit of black power that said still hung on from Reconstruction. That's right. That's exactly right. And Hoover Hoover is raised in D.C., so he's raised as a part of that. He's raised um, in in the midst of that mm -hmm. and. Um, and takes that to the FBI. And of course, like you just mentioned, the White House has his backing on that. And he begins to hire exclusively Protestant and Catholic men. He makes them sign a law enforcement pledge that's in their employee file that says in part that they will, like soldiers, they will wage vigorous warfare against the enemies of their country and its principles. And like ministers, will provide aid and comfort to those who need it. And so he takes that soldiers image. Soldiers and ministers. Soldiers and ministers. He takes that image of his own youth and childhood mm -hmm. and takes that and baptizes the FBI with that image mm -hmm. and then launches this whole religious culture within the FBI from religious um, spiritual retreats and worship services, which interestingly enough, as you pointed out, part of these are very Catholic and it's particularly their Jesuit. He's very much so sees a connection with the Jesuit militaristic idea of mm -hmm. St. Ignatius of Loyola being a soldier. Mm -hmm. So he sees the spiritual exercises of the Jesuits as being very much so compatible with his Protestant faith and puts his agents through these spiritual exercises as a way to further ingrain within them the idea that FBI agents aren't just working for the federal government but they're actually working for God as soldiers and ministers of the, of, of the American nation state. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of the coverage of Christian nationalism since the January 6th insurrection um, has seemed to emphasize, you know, the way that a Christian nationalist ideology through, you know, some of these parachurch groups and such that organized that event has sort of made possible this kind of extremism. And I think uh, people who've sort of heard the term in that conversation think sometimes, uh, oh, Christian nationalism, that must be some sort of real radical uh, fringe right. of Christianity. But what you're describing here is a vision that a very mainstream person had <laughs> running a very mainstream federal agency, the FBI, and then began to really promote as um, mainstream Christianity uh, and, and not right. just sort of on his own, but in concert with, uh, in particular, that you, you sort of outlined the way he did that in concert with the institutions of the emerging evangelical culture. So, I mean, that, as you were saying earlier, that's some of what you got into with your records request, but tell that story a little bit for folks. Uh, yeah, you said it well. I mean, um, what Hoover, um, and this time in American life, 
Hoover sees Christianity as something that he is protecting alone because he feels like the Protestant mainline, the Federal Council of Churches, later the National Council of Churches, he sees them on the left as being um, questionable, that either they're all communist because they're throwing their hands into questions about capitalism, questions about the civil rights movement and racial justice in America, he sees them as either communist or being duped and used by the communist. Mm. But then on the right, he sees people like Gerald A. L. K. Smith, Carl McIntyre, and folks of this brand, the fundamentalist. He sees those folks as um, um, questionable as well. They lack a respectability. He feels like they're loose cannons. Um, they're overtly racist. Mm. Um, they advocate at times violence. And so he doesn't trust them either. But he sees this emerging movement of white evangelicals, especially centered around Billy Graham, as being the ideal partner to help to preserve what he believes is a Christian nation. He sees folks like Billy Graham and Carl F.H. Henry as being very respectable. They're men of it with education. They're not explicitly racist or they're not calling for um, um, violence against racial groups. They're not um, anti-Semitic in, in the way that Gerald L. K. Smith and others were advocating for and Gerald Winrod. So he sees them as ideal partners and he begins to partner with them, especially around um, publication, around Christianity, publication and writing of articles for Christianity Today, um, the Campus Crusade for Christ um, publication. And as white evangelicals really hitch their political train and their faith to anti-communism, then Hoover for them is perfect because who better in the country to deem your faith sufficiently patriotic than the man who runs the agency in this country that is made to protect America from national mm -hmm. security concerns. And so both groups get something out of this. Hoover gets a reliable religious partner for his vision of a white Christian nation and evangelicals get the authenticity and the stamp of approval, literal stamp of approval from the federal government. And so from there, they have this storied relationship where Hoover writes essays for countless Christian publications, especially Christianity Today. And then Christianity Today allows Hoover to dictate what message he's going to say, how he's going to write it. They have a relationship where they come together and discuss what essays he'll write. And then these essays are not only sent to Christianity Today readers, which by this time in the 50s was, was emerging as the leading um, religious yeah. publication in the country. Um, and also the FBI sends out these essays from, to FBI field offices across the country and around the world to, to the uh, um, um, legats or legal attache offices of the FBI, the FBI across the world. And puts the literal Department of Justice stamp of approval on these essays and Christianity Today's name is on the essay as well. So then readers across the country get the idea that Christianity Today and the evangelical movement it represents is indeed in cahoots with the national government, the federal government as the authentic expression of Christian faith and politics, right? Because this is the group that it gets the literal stamp of approval from the federal government. And so these essays go across the country. And what I found in the Christianity Today file, which is over a thousand pages, are countless letters of people across the country, pastors, ministers, um, Sunday school teachers, moms and dads and youth who read Hoover's essays and write the FBI and say things such as um, ministers write to the FBI and say, Mr. Hoover, I just got in the pulpit for my Sunday sermon and read mm -hmm. your essay. Mm -hmm. the, your essay was my sermon for this Sunday. Wow. And so Hoover then becomes this ghost writer for countless evangelical sermons across the country and the world. And also people start writing for advice. So people start writing the FBI director saying, you, you, you are the authenticator, you are the adjudicator of true faith and allegiance. Tell me, is Billy Graham okay for me to listen to? Is Oral Roberts okay for me to listen to? And there are countless letters that flood the FBI with, with these requests. And so what it does, it sets Hoover up as a, 
an author of evangelical faith, but also as an adjudicator of the faith as well. Yeah. I was fascinated by that part because, you know, when I, when I was growing up in evangelicalism, Christianity Today was the, you know, it was the flagship magazine. It was the authoritative yes. voice. It's where you looked, you know, to not, not, not just for sort of what the right position was, but even, you know, what was going on, what's news they were deciding. Right. That. And that's uh, right. That's right. And yeah, to think that uh, in its early stages, when it was sort of gaining that position, um, it was actually federal promotion that was in That's part right. building that up. I mean, this the, 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 you 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 gave the numbers. I don't remember them right now, but just uh, the the numbers of, of of articles that went out on the federal dime with that Justice Department stamp oh. that you were talking about to essentially promote not just this vision, but this engine for that vision, this this Christianity Today magazine, and then That's right. not, another That's thing you get right. into, I, I think that, that it's pretty um, uh, critical here is that the National Association of Evangelicals actually develops a program to help recruit FBI agents through Christian colleges and universities because they find the uh, uh, sort of mainstream liberal colleges too liberal. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So there it is becomes a, like a training ground for them. That, there you go. It becomes a training ground. And the FBI has a uh, PhD from Washington University. His name is Fern Stukenbroker. And Fern um, becomes an FBI special agent and ghostwriter. And he has a PhD in history. And he becomes the gentleman who writes a lot of Hoover's essays, ghost writes Hoover's essays. And he also leads this program where he goes to Christian colleges around the country and speaks about the FBI, gives advice about how best to get into the FBI. And then they have federal seminars, which then um, bring uh, evangelical college students to the FBI, where they tour the FBI and receive a lecture on things such as what the FBI looks for in employees, how best to apply to get into the FBI. So it also becomes a training ground for evangelical colleges to get into the FBI. And as a way for um, the National Association of Evangelicals to really feel as if they're getting their um, act, getting access to the halls of power. And I think we've often thought of evangelicals during this time as on the outside, right? That it's the National Council of Churches that has the inside track in terms of broadcasting, whether it's radio or television. But what this history helps us to see is that evangelicals began in the 50s through the FBI to really get themselves into the halls of power. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's shaping a certain image of what it means to be Christian for yes. millions of people in the country. Um, but I and think that, and that and that also not only Christian, but also citizen, right? About yeah. who is a legitimate citizen who has the right not only to vote, but to live in certain places, hmm. who has the right to have leadership positions, to lead the nation, who has the right to influence public policy. Hmm. All of that comes along with this notion of Christianity as well. And, and obviously that has class and racial implications that go along with it. Yeah. And implied in that, as you've already indicated, is, uh, is this suggestion that, that, that then there are other people who are not real Christians and, that, and right. that's not a real authentic way of following Jesus and and Hoover gets very explicit about that in the 60s in terms of focusing in on someone who I think for many of us who love Jesus and justice um, uh, was quite influential in how uh, we came to understand our faith uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King that's right. uh, so yeah, sh sh share some of that story um, of why Hoover thought King was so dangerous to his vision of Christian nationalism, and then the lengths to which he was willing to go to undermine King. That's right. Um, Hoover is convinced because that King wants to change parts of American society. He's convinced that King has to be a communist. Hmm. And Hoover understands um, that American democracy is the best expression of the Ten Commandments and that American society is something that has been ordained by God. And so anybody who wants to change American society, right, is not just, not just doesn't have just a policy difference, but mm -hmm. actually has a fight and a battle with God. That's the way Hoover understands this. 
So he sees King, well, clearly anyone who wants to change American society at its, its structural level, at a structural level, must be a communist because communists are atheists and they hate God. Hmm. He's convinced of this. In 1963, um, the FBI does a comprehensive assessment of communist infiltration in the civil rights movement. And the FBI determines that there was no significant communist infiltration in the civil rights movement. Um, they were reading their Bibles, not Karl Marx. There you go. <laughs> and Hoover, Hoover doesn't believe his own agents. He tells them they're wrong because he has some informants who point out that King does have in a close inner circle folks who have some connections to the Communist Party. So he says, well, therefore, right, King must be a communist. And he tells his agents in the domestic intelligence division, you all are wrong. You got this wrong. And so they all, um, this is right around the time of the March on Washington. Hmm. King delivers his I Have a Dream speech, which many of us know, recited as children, be, electrifies the country, helps the Kennedy White House move Congress along for the civil rights bill. And that's it for Hoover. Hoover says, like, you all are wrong. And he proved it yesterday. Mm. The agents come back and say, you're right, Mr. Hoover. We've limited our um, investigation to facts that will stand up in front of Congress and courts. We've got to move and find other facts mm. to prove the fact that he is a communist. And this is a quote, and the most dangerous Negro in America today. And so the FBI from there in 1963 until King's death, as, as Shane pointed out in 1968, they pursue him. They pursue him in terms of um, getting permission from uh, the Bobby Kennedy Department of Justice to surveil him and his every move. Mm -hmm. And they also engage in counterintelligence. So not only is the FBI listening to wherever King is going and spying on him, they're also engaging in counterintelligence. So they make a collect a recording of King's um, um, of King in hotel rooms across the country. And they record it, which purportedly has recordings of Martin Luther King Jr. engaging in adultery. And they make a mixtape, if you will, and they send it to King's house along with an anonymous letter that they draft as if it's from an African-American Christian to tell King that he is done. They call him a beast. They tell him he is, Satan could do mo no more evil and that King is, King is exposed, that we're going to expose you. They don't say it's from the FBI. It's just an anonymous letter. Mm -hmm. Coretta discovers this after King has won the Nobel Peace Prize in January. Um, when, um, when they return, she hears this tape and they read the letter and King, of course, knows that it's from who else could have this but the FBI. Yeah. And they also convince an African-American evangelical holiness preacher by the name of Elder Lightfoot Solomon Mishal to um, coordinate with them. And so they start feeding Mishal counterintelligence and information on Martin Luther King Jr. to help to coordinate their campaign against him. Mashal was the first preacher, probably black or white in this country, to have his own TV show. His own TV show premiered in November of 1947. So very early on, yeah. he had a radio show, uh, went across the country on CBS radio. And so he begins preaching sermons saying that King is a communist and that King is not inspired by the Bible. His, his quest for justice um, is not something that's biblical. That's something that's not biblical. And he's African-American. And so as he's doing this, you have Christianity Today and others also saying this integration thing is not Christian. We shouldn't force people on this. So the FBI has this coordinated attack that they're attacking King personally, but also politically in the public square. And the reason why, and I'll stop after this, the reason why I think this is so pernicious is not simply because it's the federal government using taxpayer dollars to attack a fellow citizen. Um, based on his personal uh, uh, actions, nothing political, but personal actions. It's also really pernicious because when King was a young man and his grandmother died, um, he, 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 he was distraught and King jumped off the roof of his house because he was so distraught. He lost his grandmother. 
Mm. And so that story was public in Time Magazine when King was man of the year. Mm. And so for the FBI to send King a letter attacking him psychologically, telling him that he should um, he should bow out of the civil rights movement and he should end it. Mm. Um, that's almost playing on the fact of someone who's had right in the past at least one incident of mm. being so distraught that they tried self harm. And so for the FBI to encourage that, I think is even more pernicious. And King's personal attorney who lives near us and is with us at this, um, was with us at the King Institute, shared with us that at one point in time, King was, was, was just being besieged on all sides and was really, really, really um, depressed because of all that was happening, all that he was going against. And King's physician said, this man needs to see a therapist. And Clarence Jones shared with us that all of them said, no, he can't because the FBI might break into the therapist's office and steal the therapy notes and then try to leak them to the public mm -hmm. to make Martin Luther King Jr. seem as if he's mentally unstable. Mm -hmm. So the campaign against King not only was political, but it was so personal and it even hindered him from receiving the type of therapy and conversation and healing, holistic healing that he could have he could have went after, but he couldn't do it because of the FBI. Yeah. My, my, my. Um, we're we're going to uh, turn here in a few minutes to uh, questions from, from folks who are joining us uh, online, because I know, I know folks want to jump in, but, um, but wow, this is a lot. And you've spent a lot of time facing it head on. I mean, for, for folks who haven't read the book yet, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it's obviously something that you care deeply about, but you you do this book as an historian, documenting everything. I mean, you, I, I can just imagine you with like thousands of pages of yeah. documents writing this thing. I mean, carefully researched and 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 documented. And you know, as a historian, you 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 sort of lay it all out there and and are uh, le leaving it on the public record for folks to make sense of. But I just wanted to kind of conclude by asking you, in this moment that we're in, where you know um, the dangers of white Christian nationalism are pretty evident. Uh, the sociology on this, you know, uh, it makes it clear that. It's not just a sort of small group of extremists who believe these things. These, these ideas are pretty widespread, um, both among white Christians and, um, and among you know, people who are part of the Republican Party in the United States today. Um, the data is pretty clear on that. Um, what do you think folks do with this? What, what, yeah. what do we do with this uh, in the face of all that? If we, if we do believe in the possibility of a multi-ethnic democracy. And we want that for ourselves and for our neighbors. And if as Christians, we want to follow the Jesus who does challenge unjust systems and bring change to the world, uh, how do we reckon with this history and with you know, all the kind of uh, powers that have, um, that have done so much to really stamp down and even try to kill people mm -hmm. who've advocated a better way. Absolutely. I think there's a couple of things, but I'll, I'll share with you too. On For evangelicals, I think it's important to be honest about the history mm -hmm. and to not assume that if you don't know this history, then you'll assume that, okay, if we can just get rid of ex politician, you know, if we can just get rid of President Trump, mm -hmm. then everything can go back to, you know, being the real evangelical faith, right? I think what this history does, if we're honest about our history and we want to look it square in the face, we'll see that evangelicals have been reaching out to politicos with very questionable morals and certainly not the same theological beliefs as their political champion. And I think that tradition, that habit, that yeah. practice has been with the evangelical faith, at least the modern evangelical movement from the very beginning with J. Edgar Hoover. As you said earlier, Christianity today grew in part off of his pen. Mm. So we have to be honest about that. And honest about the fact that, as I try to point out in the book, there's a small remnant of evangelicals who start writing into Christianity today saying, this is not okay. Mm. Why, why, are you, why are you banking our faith on someone like J. Edgar Hoover, who you know is racist, 
who is um, 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 paranoid in many ways, who doesn't align with us theologically and morally. Why mm. are you doing this? So I think it's important to recognize, to look our history straight in the face and say, this is not about getting rid of one particular person. Mm. This is about examining our entire theological foundation and our entire political practice that we've been doing for quite some time. I think that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would say historically is also on the democracy side is to think about, um, to be honest in the, and to think about our FBI and how our FBI as it relates to religion has often thought of religion in terms of uh, the norm as a kind of Christian faith that's about personal piety and, um, and, and, and looks at other forms of faith suspiciously. And as a result has surveilled groups that have fought for justice as they see them as not being aligned with Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're going to be honest, we also, the FBI has to be honest about its history and its practice and its reinforcing of a kind of white Christian nationalism. And if mm -hmm. we're going to ever move forward to a perfect union, we have to first deal with and be honest with our history. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let me bring in a few questions from folks who are with us um, online. Paul asks, is there a mainstream white nationalism today? Um, and you know, what does white Christian nationalism look like if it's, if it's not just people storming the Capitol? Um, what are its more mainstream expressions today? You know, I think that's a great question. I think the mainstream expression, I think, unfortunately, um, is um, aligned with a great deal of Donald Trump and a great deal of what we've seen with data in terms of um, a certain segment of um, voters today. Mm -hmm. I think what's dangerous is that what used to be considered, it seems to me, the extreme right, those who thought violence was uh, an important mechanism to, bring, to achieve their political goals, I unfortunately think the extreme right and the mainstream right are becoming really closely linked. Yeah. yeah. Right. In the past, you know, we, we would not see, you know, we could we could critique certain ideas about evangelicalism in the past, but the folks who advocated for violence, like you know, Gerald Winrod and Gerald L.K. Smith, William Dudley Pelly, these names, you know, we they were kind of marginal in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it, we had these moments where they would get mainstream acceptance. You can even think about in the 80s with David Duke, who mm -hmm. was, you know, saw himself as a Christian and a Klansman. But it seems now at the national level that we are experiencing a close connection with the kind of extreme right and a mainstream right. And I think that's something that's very dangerous in the life of our nation. And um, as we think about folks who are advocating that the Republican Party should be a Christian nationalist party, for example. Yeah. I mean, this is a this is a this is an official who was elected at the national level and is you know and engaged in legislation. I think that that should be concerning for all of us. Yeah. Uh, here, here's a short question, uh, 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 but a, a good one for a historian. Uh, what year did Hoover's contributions to Christianity Today end? Lynn wants to know. When, when, when did he have his last article on CT? He wrote his last article um, right a month before he died. Okay. He, turn, he turned it in 72. around in April 72, and it yeah. was published. Um, and then after his death, the magazine, um, you know, uh, mourned his death. And I, I, I document this. Um, it wasn't until Hoover's um, evidence came out in 1970, um, uh, even after evidence came out in 1971 that Hoover was doing what everyone thought he was doing when a group of group of uh, Protestants, Catholics and Jews broke into an FBI office and stole FBI documents and leaked them to the Washington Post. Christianity Today still embraced him and he wrote essays until his death um and 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 uh april and may of 1972 so that's when the that's when his essays stop okay uh ross asks um about polls that showed uh j edgar hoover was more popular than mlk among americans in general and yes. says, are there are there any polls or research showing whether african americans were more sympathetic to mlk or to hoover or to somebody like um the elder uh yeah Lightfoot Michaud, who, yeah. who the FBI was using. 
It's a great question. The, there are polls, the Gallup poll, Washington Post poll that show that Americans were overwhelmingly on the side of Hoover against Martin Luther King Jr. And then in 1966, Gallup does a poll and Americans overwhelmingly find Martin Luther King Jr. unfavorable. Um, so our mem our memory of him as this national hero, yeah. right, is something that's created significantly after his death yeah. and seeing him as a martyr. But while he was alive, even before he came out against the Vietnam War, King was seen as unfavorable in this country. Mm. Um, the March on Washington of 63 is kind of like the zenith and the high point for King. And then from there begins to his popularity begins to go downhill. Um, there are a number of African-American newspapers. There are not any polls, but I do cite a number of letters to the editor in African-American newspapers who say, you know, I don't always agree with Martin Luther King Jr., mm. but this elder Lightfoot Solomon Michaud guy, you, you can't be critiquing Martin Luther King Jr., like you, not publicly, right? Because we don't want to present to mm. the broader American public that African-Americans are divided on these questions. Right. So that's something you keep in house. You don't preach that on the radio in a sermon. You don't write an editorial about that. Mm -hmm. One person even says, and I cite this, it says um, there are three there are three traditions that must be kept. It was like Sunday at church, Saturday night at the movies and not critiquing Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a number of African-Americans who wrote in the newspapers who you know, the question wasn't about whether they agreed with King's um, or not, King with King's um, uh, advocacy and, and activism, but they just felt that Michelle was wrong for publicly siding with the FBI director. Okay. Uh, I see that Reverend Sharon Risher is with us. Greetings to you, Reverend Risher. I don't know if you, re you know her beautiful work, but she's, uh, she's doing great work these days. She has a question. Um, can we connect what's happening today with the banning of books, the mm. anti-abortion laws, the attacks on so-called CRT, uh, with this earlier stance on Christian nationalism? I think she's saying with with the uh, the position that that Hoover was promoting. I think so. I do think so. In the sense that um, a lot of Christian nationalists aren't so much concerned about theology so much, right? So. Hoover embraced Catholics, so he wasn't really concerned about questions of atonement, questions of, you know, the resurrection. Um, they're more concerned about police policing the behavior of the others. Hmm. And I think Hoover, as the FBI, was certainly involved in surveilling everyone else and policing everyone else's behaviors, even though he himself didn't follow those. So, for example, Hoover would write essays about parenting and if I had a son. And Hoover, most of you know, was never married. He was involved at least in a domestic partnership with his assistant director at the FBI, a man by the name of Special Agent Clyde Tolson. There's no real evidence of them ever being sexually um, um, intimate, but they were in terms of their relationship was very much so a domestic partnership. They worked together. They, they uh, went to work together every day. They ate lunch together every day. They ate dinner together every day and they vacation together every year. So they were in a domestic partnership. Mm -hmm. And so Hoover was policing the sexuality of queer brothers and sisters. He was policing the sexual practices of ministers. He was policing the family values of, Amer of Americans. And yet he himself didn't practice those. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's a sense in which the policing of other people's behaviors and piety there is a connection between what Hoover was doing with the Christian nationalism and what we see today about policing the behaviors of other groups, right? Doing it so underneath the guise of religious freedom and Americanism, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like my religious freedom is more about my ability to practice my faith and stopping you from doing what you think is right. And that's mm -hmm. the American way, right? Mm -hmm. So I do think there's a connection here with the way Hoover was policing America and policing the behavior of faith communities and what we see today. Yeah. Well, one one final question. We're coming to the end of our time, but I, I wanted to ask you because you are there at the King Institute, and because mm -hmm. you you said your own uh, journey was so influenced by yes. King. I I wonder if you would speculate if both uh, Martin and Coretta mm -hmm. knew what you've learned. And they did know much of it, 
But yes. if they knew everything that you've learned, That's a how great do you question. think they would respond in their own gospel-informed tradition? Um, I think that given their experiences, they would probably, you know, I would like to think they would read my book and say like, hey man, like I've been trying to tell y'all. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but I do think, um, I do think that Hoover was so popular with the American public at the mm -hmm. time he was alive that I don't think they would be surprised by much of this. Mm -hmm. And Coretta and Martin both knew the FBI was after him. Mm -hmm. um, so they wouldn't be surprised by that either. I think what Coretta and Martin would say to us today more so would probably would be, why are you surprised? Mm. I think Car Coretta and Martin both often talked about America's dance around justice, especially racial and economic justice. Mm -hmm. But there was always one or two steps forward and there was always going to be a backlash and go one or two steps back. So I think Martin and Coretta would tell us, you all shouldn't be surprised that we're experiencing this backlash after the series of protests in this country unleashed after George Floyd. You shouldn't be surprised that there's a push to get rid of any conversations around race in public schools, to remove books, certain types of books from public libraries and schools. I think they would tell us, why are you surprised? And that you should always keep your foot on the gas and always move forward in faith because know that when there's going when there's gains there's always going to be a pushback well a hearty amen to that and on behalf <laughs> of the whole um, red letter christian community here thank you so much for being with us tonight no thank you for having me it was an absolute pleasure and, and honor to be with you and i want to thank everyone for for tuning in it's just such an honor and a privilege to have people read your work and it means a lot. So, so thank you to be, uh, to join you all tonight and be a part of this community. It, it means a lot. Well, bless you. Thank